So hello, welcome uh, to the call. Um, we all know each other, but for the sake of the call, I guess we could just do a round of introductions uh, as per usual. So uh, I'm Tim Hill of the uh, Open Data Institute, uh, chairing the call. Uh, Nathan, over to you. Uh, my name's Nathan. I'm a developer for Playfinder slash BookDeck. Uh, Nick Evans from IMIN. Okay, fantastic. The topic for today's call is, is just about documentation, really, um, because we have an awful lot of stuff. Um, and I was just looking for a bit of feedback on our documentation and possible paths forward uh, to make sure people can use our standards more accessibly. Um, let me just bring up the slides. Um, We have a lot of documentation scattered over several different locations. Uh, there's the standards themselves, obviously. Uh, we've got the developer website at developer.openactive.io. Uh, we have over 100 GitHub repos now. Um, and that's after I deleted several, in fact. Um, we had a few empties lying around, but uh, we still have a lot. Um, and then there's the open booking SDK guidance site that Nick, you created uh, at the end of last year. Uh, which is a very helpful resource. Um, and I, th I suppose a good argument could be made that, um, that that's enough. Um, I suppose that's the first question is, you know, is everything just fine with the documentation in terms of getting people off the blocks? Um, that said, I, I had um, another ODI member, staff member, take a look at our documentation as a whole. Um, and she flagged up a kind of common methodology or assessment tool for documentation, which is helpfully uh, the grand unified theory of documentation. So you can't argue with that. Um, and um, the point of the grand unified um, theory of documentation is really to divide up documentation into four separate types. Um, I think this is pretty frequently used in, in software development. So you've got the idea of um, essentially learning oriented tutorials, um, problem solving how to guides, uh, reference documentation. So yeah, where you just look up stuff very quickly um, and then explanation, which is the wider contextual piece. Um, and reviewing all of our documentation, it seems like we're very, very strong on how-to guides and reference. So things like the standards are, are really reference. Um, and then the developer site and the Open Active uh, SDK uh, give um, very nice how-to guides for common issues. And where we're weak, it seems to my mind, is on tutorials and on contextual explanation. Um, Certainly very clear with tutorials. I mean, it's, I suppose you can sometimes argue a little bit about what constitutes an explanation. Um, but it seems like in terms of tutorials, in terms of actual handholding step by step, you know, do this first and then do this next kind of uh, learning introductions, we don't really have much there. Um, so I suppose the first point uh, to talk about would be um, is this a useful framework uh, to analyze our documentation via? Um, and then if it is a useful framework, uh, is that a fair summary of, of what we've got right now on the ground? And I feel like Nick's had a hand in, Nick has commented to com is, is qualified to comment because he's written so much of the documentation and Nathan is qualified to comment because he's uh, presumably read so much of it and had to wade through it. So we've got both ends of the equation here. Uh, yeah, sure, I can pick this up. Um, so I do, I, I'd not heard of the uh, Grand Unified Theory of Documentation before, but I do like the approach. It seems fairly sensible. Um, that does kind of gel up with a lot of the problems that we had when we were implementing it. Um, in that uh, we started with the reference, which I think was a mistake. So we essentially started from the specifications and then built uh, things out from there. Um, and that meant that we missed a few things that weren't in the parts of the uh, specification that we were reading. Um, but were in other parts or would have been in kind of like a more top-down 
level like tutorial or explanation about what's going on. Um, I feel like if there was come some kind of step by step um, on how to build a feed, um, especially the bookings feed kind of from the ground up, that would be very helpful for new people implementing um, system. I think it would also be quite helpful to have um, a separate tutorial for people who are consuming the feed. Obviously that feed, uh, that tutorial is a lot simpler um, because consuming is a lot simpler, um, especially with the RPT feeds. But just some kind of like common pitfalls and things that you can notify a lot easier in a tutorial aspect than you can in the specification just by saying, your implementation should do this, for example. Yeah, and um, I think I think sometimes we have jammed kind of specific problems we've run into into the how tos or into the references, and sometimes that makes it a little bit confusing. That there'll be a sort of note attached to one of the specification um, cells saying, you know, never do this, and it's you know it's unclear what particularly motivated that um, particular comment, but. Uh, um, Nick, do you have any uh, reflections on that? Uh, yeah, that sounds, I, yeah, I agree with that. I think we, we funnily enough, um, unsurprisingly, started out with the Grand Unified Theory of Documentation when uh, initially kind of doing the docs way back when. Um, and so, yeah, definitely that, that's a good, that's a good point those gaps definitely exist um, mm -hmm. I, from my perspective there's like a big list of documents we should probably have that I've kind of been like have been in my head for a while at least um, and um, haven't I don't think we've really translated that into well it's been on the on like a um, what's been required basis like a lot of the documentation has kind of sprung up in response to demand so there was a period of time um, and um, and kind of still doing this really when some question comes up i try to answer it with documentation rather mm -hmm. than just a direct email um, and that's what has created some of the kind of more um specific documentation um mm -hmm. around areas where um and and as implementations have kind of come along then filling that out further so for example the activity list documentation is now really detailed because with so many people implementing activity list and problems that came out of it, the libraries that were related to it, all that stuff. I think that even includes a video of someone's implementation, includes screenshots of someone else's implementation, it includes um, all the different ways that you could do that thing. Uh, so the activity list section, I think, is probably one of the better documented sections of, um, of, of all the, the, the documents that we've got. Um, and uh, yeah, I completely agree that starting with the spec is not the best uh, way of doing it. But I think the challenge we've got is that until we've got documentation that matches the surface area of the spec, you still do need to have that spec to kind of really check you've got everything. So um, it would be nice to, so one of the things that's good about the Open Active developer docs is that they've got all the fields referenced, um, a kind of canonical reference to all, all the descriptions in there, which is that's based off of all the, the tooling. So it all feeds through, it's, it's accurate and it's got relevant examples, et cetera. Um, so, so that's great from reference from that point of view, but we don't really have something similar from the booking specs kind of endpoints. For example, you could imagine having a page per endpoint um, with kind of detail about what kind of things that you would expect to have to implement to do that. And then like you said, Nathan, linking off to other things that may not be part of the endpoint section, but actually are, are related to it. Um, and I, th I think actually using the, um, the .NET implementation, the reference implementation to drive that could be quite a good way of doing it because we've now, because of the um, test suite and reference implementation, we've actually got to the point where we've got a quite a uh, succinct um, MVP of each endpoint in code, um, which is kind of, you know, you, does all the things it needs to do. And so um, things like checking for prepayments and checking for um, error conditions and checking for um, attendee details, that stuff all happens in C1 and C2 and B. And uh, the, the code makes that really clear because obviously there's functions that, you know, there's methods that get called that check those things at each place. And you can see if you're gonna dive into the C1 endpoint, what's that calling? Okay, what's that checking rate? What the error conditions are? Da, 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 da. Um, so obviously not everyone's gonna to wanna to read the .NET code base to figure that out. Um, but maybe there's an opportunity to, um, to, to pull some of that stuff out um, of when, when that implementation is done. And, um, and 
make it a bit prettier and, and, and I guess add some of the explanation in there as well. There's a lot of that is in the comments in the .NET work as well, that why is this there? You know, what, what's the rationale for um, certain types of things? Um, so yeah, so I, I think, yeah, I think we maybe have like 40% of the surface area of documentation we probably ideally need to remove any consultative process. Um, I think the current way it's set up, because we now have a test suite, um, I think you're probably going to have a situation where people are kind of getting failing tests. I'm getting a few of these questions from um, from some of the implementers from the, the pilot who are still going actually. Um, like kind of getting a failing test and going, why is this failing, you know, and then having to have the conversation about why that's failing because this is the reason for blah. Um, and obviously, yeah, so spec plus test suite probably gets you to a working implementation ish. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be better to do it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I was implementing something to do with OAuth for the um, for the test suite today, um, and obviously OAuth's another standard. It's got a lot of documents around it um, that exists. So we're not the test suite isn't testing OAuth; it's testing that the thing has OAuth, which is the nice level up um, to to be testing, especially when all the tooling exists um, for that. But it's interesting. It struck me when looking at the OAuth docs that actually, yeah, there's a lot of really easy getting started. Like copy paste this bit of code in and this bit of code in and this, and then you get that and a lot of the time when I've been looking for issues on the OAuth documentation because it's like basically reading specs and other people's guidance on it um, it's been it's been interesting to to get that kind of contrast where you've got an easy kind of copy paste stuff in so just so just to just to rewind a bit there because we got quite detailed there and I think I think that's already where the center of gravity is on our on our documentation and yeah obviously um, Leveraging well-written, nicely refactored code into uh, into documentation is a great place to start. But we're just looking at a lot of detail there. Um, so if you started, I guess when you say back in the day, that means with with Lee and yourself, when you started thinking about documentation in that grand unified theory way, um, was there a particular reason why explanation and tutorial got a little bit sidelined, or was it just a natural evolution that that's how it turned out. Just time. That's Just all that's been right. yeah, okay. uh, We started with a backlog of all the, with, with, with ideas of things. Um, there's um, uh, someone brilliant, a lady called Sally, who was involved as well, um, who wrote some of it. And we had, uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think we focused on reference to start with just because that was essential um, mm -hmm. and tried to get the kind of the core in there. Um, but the yeah, the reality is we just never resource this properly. And I mean, this is talk, talking from the point of view of the ODI project. Um, it was it was never something that has been kind of a focus area. It's always been a kind of uh, means to an end, rather than someone saying we're going to make sure the documentation is really great. Let's work that through. Right. Okay. So it's been it's been ad hoc kind of because it's had to be an end. Yeah, so if you like start start with a grand unified theory so we all understand what we're doing and then just ad hoc do the stuff we can do to make it slowly more like that. Um, yeah, and yeah. Um, therefore it's entirely demand driven, um, which starts with, the, which then results in what we've got right now. Yeah, okay, fair enough. There's, there's been a couple of times when um, one major implementer has started the journey um, and I've got, I've got to the point of going, oh my goodness, this is a perfect time when, you know, they're about to embark on having never looked at it. We could literally think from their perspective, what docs do they need and try and service them through that, that, that journey. Um, but just time constraints, it's never materialized. Like it would be, for, for example, if you think about someone coming in like Fit, Fitzel or um, Fitz, I can't remember their names, but yeah, the, the folks from EMD that we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to do a bunch of stuff with them. Um, virtual but it never really came off um, but when they were looking at it it was kind of an obvious thing that they'd started from from the very beginning no open active knowledge at all and you could easily see there that they were asking some of the very basic questions that everyone asks you know i've got events in this shape how do they fit within your format i mean if you're not if you're not if you don't have facilities and you have events then there's a very specific kind of decision tree you go through where you start off with i've got events and you decide whether they're session series and scheduled sessions, or are they events, or are they, and then their courses, and then they, you understand all the options over those feeds. And then the challenges around, do I use schedules or do I not? Um, so um, uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a question of partial schedules versus schedules. There's a question of um, how do I, do I have a URL that I can point to for each page? 
um, and uh, what does it what does an event represent in my system to my users? Where where are the prices and how are they set? Adult junior, etc. So these, you go through all these questions about how does that what does that look like, and then the, yeah, and then they, they usually come up with the feeds, and then there's there's kind of further questions: how does the activity list work? What's the value of that? Um, you know, I've got I've got some data that doesn't fit with the model. Where do I put that? Do I leave it out? Do I keep it in? Obviously, we want to keep it in. So then you start explaining the beta properties and how that works, and all of this stuff is in reference implementation. But you could you could easily see uh, is in sorry in the in the reference documentation like how does beta work etc. But you could easily see a flow there through you know from zero to decision tree of what do I got and how do I implement that through to um, okay now I know which you know what what kind of event structure I'm going to use and how it matches to my database. This is where how I'm going to link the activity list in. This is where I'm going to put the detail in the other fields. Um, yeah, and then obviously through to booking. Okay, so that's um, that seems like um, an expansion of the how-to capacity or sort of universal how-to in the sense that I think we've got a lot of how-tos that are attached to individual repos all the time, quite strong there, but not a plan for how you link all of those together. Um, um, well, actually, it's a little bit how to, but it's also a little bit um, kind of tutorial like, I guess, like in, in a getting started sense. Like, uh, I think so. The, the, the GUT um, kind of idea of what a tutorial is is that it's really hand holding, that it's not sort of I've got this data, how do I shape it? It's like, let's pretend you have this data. Um, and you need to get all the way through, right? So it really is like, if you type all the keystrokes that are on the page in front of you or in the video in front of you, you know, you will get to that endpoint. It's, it's very, very hands-on. Um, which, I guess, I guess the question is, um, jumping ahead, um, do we have a kind of sufficiently universal use case that that kind of tutorial would be useful in, in the GUT sense of a very specific kind of, I have a yoga class, I would take you from having a yoga class to having a data feed to having booking, um, you know, through that journey in a tutorial, or is it the case that if we provided that kind of example, um, we have so many different kinds of clientele, that they'd be like, well, that's not relevant to me. That doesn't answer, you know, to, to my requirements. I guess like how I'd see it is you've got kind of two types of clients. Um, you've got people that are running on a very small scale. So either people doing like yoga classes and things like that, potentially renting out other spaces. And then you've got the actual venues themselves that are providing data. Um, and they're much more likely to have kind of uh, things like football pitches rather than events. So events will probably be useful for both of them, but there's mm -hmm. definitely, I think, a use case for like uh, someone that's running like a personal trainer um, website or something like that, where they just have specific events and it's not quite as um, uh, like open as like a slot based feed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we had if we had um, something that really took you from from zero to to full booking capacity as an event, and then something that that modeled that as as slots, yeah, that would probably cover you know most of the surface area. Obviously, there's always outliers, but yeah, I feel like that would cover enough so that you could get um, a reasonable kind of first draft MVP done mm -hmm. from that um, attached to your own database. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like all of the extra functionality is very much stuff that you'd investigate as you required it rather than necessarily needing to know it right. up front. Because um, we want to avoid the problem of making our tutorials too in depth. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I don't know if you've ever read the Perl tutorial. Um, that's a classic example of a very bad tutorial uh, because our, halfway through the first page, where it's explaining how to create a calculator. Um, it starts going into the methodology of behind Perl <laughs> and goes off on a bit of a tangent. That that seems very Perl to me, though. That's <laughs> 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 Either you're going to love this or you're going to hate it. Leave now if you if you don't like it. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, yeah. Much so. Um, 
Okay. Um, right, yeah, so sort of a fairly, uh, yeah, without getting into the weeds of, of implementation. Um, so I guess that answers the second question, which I put on the slide, which is just how do we deal with different technical stacks there? Because of course a tutorial is usually within some particular language. And I, I guess I'm not sure what hello world should look like in, a, in an open active space. Um, it's well, hard. You could potentially, sorry to, oh, there, no. but you, you could potentially borrow from uh, the way that Stripe does their documentation. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the Stripe documentation for every code snippet, there are tabs to switch between different languages. So there's one for Go, one for .NET, one for PHP. Um, I, I can't remember what the kind of breadth of languages that we currently have libraries for is, but um, that kind of thing would be very, very useful. Right, okay, so if it was .NET, PHP, and Ruby, I mean, again, that would give us quite a, Significant coverage of, of implementations. Exactly. Yeah, that'll yeah, definitely yeah. give you enough so that people in other languages would be able to take that as a base. Okay. Cool. Um, go for it. Um, yeah, book supports that as well, which is good. Oh, okay, so it's, it's got a widget for tabbing between the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess then the what about the what about the back end? So at some point, database schema is going to be a, a question. Um, I assume relational databases are the, the stock and trade. That some kind of SQL example is enough. Yeah, see, I, I remember when I was looking into the RPD feeds, you got some SQL examples mm -hmm. um, of how to pull out um, a specific page. Um, so something like that would be helpful. Um, but I, I kind of feel like you don't don't really need to worry yourself too much about what the database scheme is going to be because everyone's going to be different and it's probably going to be attaching it to an existing schema. So just kind of a general example of what kind of query you need to write should be enough. Yeah, I've been, I've been surprised by the number of questions I've had that have been a bit like, I have a lot of tables, where's my data? And I'm, I'm left a bit like, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose a very simplified kind of idealized um, SQL representation should should cover, should be legible yeah. to most developers, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Um, if everything in the tutorial is kind of based off um, the schema in a database, essentially exactly mirrors the schema of Open Active, right. then that's yeah. going to simplify a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, explanations around that. Mm -hmm. And then if people have schema where, for example, the slot object is in several different database, uh, several different tables, mm -hmm then that's, that's not really the kind of thing a, a tutorial would be helpful to investigate. Although it might be worth um, having a, a how-to related to that on the benefits of materializing data and caching it in a table versus using a join um, yeah. because of performance. And you could, you could cite different examples where, I guess it's back to that decision tree. How do I, how do I structure and I store my data? Pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. uh, you can explain that the easiest thing to do when you're building it is to build it based on the objects that directly mirror the schema. Or at yeah, least again, I feel like you need. I feel like, again, that might be more of a, a how-to kind of question than a tutorial kind of, yeah, kind of issue, but um, yeah. yeah. De sorry, that's definitely a how-to, but I'm just thinking like that's where you link off in the tutorial to mm -hmm. those how-tos. Yeah. When the, so people going through the tutorial and they get stuck at that certain point, they they have somewhere to go that's not kind of like, oh gosh, this doesn't look like my database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Linky linkiness is is a good thing. Um, yeah. Okay. That seems that seems like a pretty coherent um, plan of action, really. Um, and yeah, that covers most use cases, I would imagine, for a, for a legibility point of view. Um, so that leaves the woolier question of explanation, uh, which is that kind of contextual quadrant. Um, and I guess the, the difficulty with that is, I mean, I think anybody approaching Open Active right now from outside the activity sector would just be bewildered by it. I think there's just a, you know, what am, what am I representing? What am I doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it makes more sense if you're already familiar with the domain. Um, and I guess the question then becomes like, what, what's the audience for contextual explanation? Where are developers 
coming from. Um, I almost feel like the explanation part is for non-developers. I think it, oh, so I think in this case, I would hope that non-developers would get everything they would need from the non-developer website, like the standard open active, like right, yeah, what's, what's the point of the whole enterprise um, they'd get from the non-developer website. Um, but, I, mean, I guess what I, Sorry. I, I guess, I guess what I'm wondering is, I, I feel like a developer who's working for a large, you know, an established booking system like, or you know, leisure management system, you know, they, they probably don't need a lot of explanation. I'm not sure. Um, but if you're an agency who's been hired by, you know, the equivalent of open sessions or something like that, maybe you've got a different kind of need, but I don't have a sense of where developers are starting from actually in the open active ecosystem. Yeah. Well, I guess most of the time um, a developer will be starting from, can you integrate this or can you provide this feed? So it's either as a consumer, these people have come to us and they said, oh, they use the open active spec. Can you write uh, an implementation to handle that? Or we want you to provide data using the open active spec. Can you build that? Um, I feel like those are the only two real use cases. Um, so in a way, you're, st you're not starting Greenfield in a way. You're kind of... Yeah. You know. Yeah, you're starting from kind of like, why do I need to build it in this specific way kind of way? Yeah, I guess I guess building on that, maybe, maybe some of the specifics that would be useful to explain a lot, slightly more conceptual would be why are there feeds? Why not an API? Um, where is my API? <laughs> you know, um, where's my the one big API I can plug into to get all the open active data? Um, why isn't there one? Um, and and then like you know the activity list, what is that? Um, like because there's almost like a very you can imagine like a very rough diagram which is like one activity list, lots of feeds from different providers, consumer consuming feeds, and then like underneath why this is so. Like mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of really good rationale behind the design of that ecosystem and like laying out the, the, the reasons for it so that someone doesn't come in and goes, oh, hang on, this doesn't work for me. Because if they kind of go through it, they'll realize that it probably does work for them, um, but they just haven't thought the problem through enough yet. Yeah. Right, yeah, so the problem we're solving is data synchronization. Here is how it is solved. Um, and yeah, there's why these steps are required. Okay, um, yeah, and, and less on the domain kind of like, here's what an opportunity is. Here's why they exist in the, in the field of gyms. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I think that's, I guess the final question then would be, um, despite the fact that we're small in number, I feel like um, you guys on this call are actually fairly um, informed about what it looks like to be a, a developer approaching this for the first time. But I guess the question is who's not on this call who would have a different view? What kind of organization isn't getting a look in right now? Um, it would be interesting to hear from uh, Jerry, the developer from Schools Plus, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, of course he's much more recently been implementing the booking spec and mm -hmm. to kind of get his opinion from it. Um, and then I guess someone else that would be helpful is someone who is more recently implementing uh, a consumer. Because mm -hmm. um, of course we've had this um, in the pipeline now for about six or eight months. So we're quite a long way away from when we first kind of said, oh, let's look at open active and see if we can implement that as a feed. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so consumers are underrepresented. Um, but is there, is there a kind of, because I feel like even, even Schools Plus is an organization kind of similar to other organizations that we deal with. I mean, they've got some specific problems, but they're not, they're not really outliers in terms of what they do. Yeah, um, I guess the the main kind of company that I imagine maybe exists, but might not, is the kind of uh, smaller scale, single event type people. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like they're probably underrepresented by probably just not having development teams. 
Right. Yeah. Because they're not that scale, but they might in the future want to be able to put something like that in their website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's useful to think about. Um, and we do sometimes sort of field questions like, why isn't there a WordPress plugin to do this kind of thing, which kind of indicates a sort of completely different orientation, which yeah. is probably not something that can be answered except in a kind of explanation way of saying, here's why that doesn't exist. Um, yeah. yeah. Although in fairness, some of the WordPress sites actually include a large number of events um, coming from a WordPress database as, as the source. So it's not necessarily a, a one event uh, thing. Yeah, I, I, I did think there was a there was a point where working with EMD, a WordPress plugin was looking like an interesting thing. But mm -hmm. the problem then that actually comes next, because we did investigate that, is that um, there's a number of different plugins actually that people actually already use for events um, in WordPress. And so it becomes not a plugin to WordPress, but actually in addition to the plugins that exist. Yeah, yeah. Different schemas. And then you're into yeah. kind of what's the most popular events WordPress plugin and can we get that to adopt you know, mm -hmm. open active spec? And uh, it turns out there isn't, well, there didn't seem to be from our, our, our loose research that wasn't like one events plugin everyone was using. It was like everyone mm -hmm. was using just whatever they found on Google. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think that's, I think that's probably about it in terms of documentation it feels like actually most of the question the most of the answers are fairly straightforward um i guess are there any uh, sort of random or um particular difficulties that you've encountered um i'd say when i was writing uh the booking api um the the main problem i had with that was kind of get, getting my head around how all of the different types of order interact. Because um, of course that flow can be relatively complicated depending on which flow you're going through. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, because there are different opportunities of which types of flow you're using. Um, and trying to support as many as possible. Um, so I guess that's probably the most complicated bit that I found. Um, I've noticed that when I was working with Schools Plus, they were having dif difficulty with the RPD feed. And essentially a uh, confusion that they found was the after timestamp being the current timestamp rather than the timestamp of the last item in the page. Um, which caused us some problems because we were just infinitely pulling data from them, obviously. Right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think conceptually RPD is kind of interesting. Again, that's that's the kind of explanation level, I suppose, is that I think where I've hit the buffers with in, in correspondence that you've seen, Nathan. Um, yeah, trying to explain what that works and why you're doing it, I guess, is sort of a despite the fact that it's quite well documented, there's clearly a big conceptual hurdle that a lot of developers have to go over to to get there. Yeah, it took me a while to understand, but as soon as I understood it, it made perfect sense. Hmm. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, once you, once you push through the membrane, um, it's here on the yeah. other side. Because essentially, I think um, a good way of describing it um, is it's essentially it's trying to mirror a database. So it's more like, um, uh, what's it called? Like database synchronization rather than um, an API as you would normally have an API. Did you um, show the video that's on the developer site to whoever was confused about it? Did that help? Um, I sent them links to the developer site um, and I sent them a few diagrams. But I think they'd kind of already got that assumption stuck in their mind. Mm. So they, they weren't quite understanding what was going on. Um, so kind of moving on from that was a bit complicated. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I've definitely seen this happen a few times and it is an interesting one how to, so the, the, the video that's like a 10 minute long voiceover of like, this is an animated attempt yeah. to explain RPDE was trying to combat that uh, kind of issue. I think people read RPDE and they just think, oh, it's definitely this almost before finishing reading. Yeah. And then they kind of stop and I don't know how, yeah. 
um, especially as like that thing about using the query correctly, which must be written in like 15 different places. Definitely check the query as you, you know, the right brackets in the right. <laughs> this is the most common issue and every time. Yeah. One in five, maybe implementations have that query wrong. So I, I feel like we probably got, I'm not sure how we organize the documentation such that that stuff is maybe clearer or, um, or maybe it's just that developers tend to have a tendency as, as I have been with the OAuth stuff to just dive in and just get it working. And so, yeah. So perhaps, um, cause I've, I've thought that the, um, the information about uh, RPD was fairly clear and quite easy to follow, but maybe if it was kind of more of a handholding kind of explanation that use some kind of like, uh, no, it'd be difficult, but, maybe some kind of like uh, simple database triggers that were randomly generating uh, new RPD items. So you could actually just kind of get this little thing that you could kind of test out and try. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, demo sort of RPD. Um, yeah, that is I guess, sorry, sorry. Karen. So um, uh, I guess like if there was some kind of publicly accessible, but kind of like uh, open active branded example and implementation of it, um, which I think it already is, but um, hmm. just to say like, this is how it works. This will generate these items like randomly over a period of time. So you can pull in all of the feed and then you can kind of see how it works. Um, but just kind of like, at a small enough scale of items so it's human readable. Mm -hmm. The problem I had when I first looked at the GLL feed is it's essentially like it's 40 pages of deleted items before yeah, you get to yeah. anything that's not deleted. So trying to read that as a human is kind of very complicated. Yeah, so you have to have faith that if you keep clicking on those links at the top of the page, it's eventually going to get you to, and at, yeah, at some point around page 28, you're thinking, hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just, all these pages are exactly the same. I don't get it. Yeah. 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 Um, there, yeah the, the Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say it's also about simplicity of data representation as well, is that I've sometimes pointed people to existing RPG feeds, but then often you'll get, you know, <sighs> kind of curious or slightly bespoke or very long-winded sort of description data or whatever. And I think that makes the situation worse because then people sort of try to map to this, you know, quite specific kind of implementation rather than the general picture, which is, which is much easier. Um, so yeah, having a kind of dummy feed that was populated with like, you know, platonic ideals um, would, would help. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like until we have that, um, uh, you would be able to point to one of the book tech feeds because unlike a lot of implementations I see, we do have very, very big pages. So we limit our pages to a thousand items. So that normally gets through all of the deleted stuff and then hits the actual slots. You can kind of scroll through and see what's going on. Okay, that would be helpful. Yeah, and that in itself is pretty good. Like these are the feeds that you should look at that are probably simple to start with. Mm -hmm. Might mm -hmm. just be a nice point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would help. And there's also worth saying that the reference implementation that exists, well, there's two actually, there's one in .NET and one in Node. Node one's called Lorium fits and randomly generates sessions. And then the, the um, uh, .NET one, similar, but less kind of bulky data. Um, and they are public accessible URLs. So, I mean, you could imagine, I mean, if there's, if there's cores on those endpoints, you could imagine like a, a very simple uh, little, little JavaScript page which um, like one of those embed JS fiddle things, but you just press next. In fact, yeah. um, Dan um, from Open... Uh, oh, Dan Winchester. Dan Winchester has created that on his website, isn't he? There is a next button you can press to take you through the feeds. Um, I, I know we don't point to that anywhere on our website, but we should probably, uh, mm. there might be some leveraging of that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I do actually have to go, guys, because I've got another meeting. Oh, yeah, we're at the top of the call. Okay, thank you very much for uh, for joining, Nathan. Um, no um, any other business uh, you'd like to squeak in in two minutes, or are you good? Uh, no, I think that's all for me. Okay, and anything from you, Nick? No, that's great. Okay, thank you very much for joining, both of you.